my name is Dr. Rujan Ekley, and for those of you that do not know me, I am an ER physician until recently employed at the GBHS hospital for the last four years as the emergency physician. And throughout this whole pandemic, that is where I was employed. What I was seeing in my ER department, especially in the last eight to nine months, is related to D-dimer levels in my career as an ER physician. We use the D-dimer test specifically related to pulmonary embolisms as well as deep vein thrombosis. D-dimer shows up any thrombosis in the body, but it doesn't give you a diagnosis. It gives you a basis on going further and doing this ultrasound and CT scan to either confirm or deny the presence of a deep vein thrombosis as well as a pulmonary embolism. The first part of 2020 was probably the slowest ever in emerge department. When we went into 2021, when the vaccination rollout policy started, we did end up seeing an increase in the amount of strokes, transient ischemic attacks, and stroke-like presentations. Definitely significant more numbers of those people coming in. I ended up doing D-dimer tests on these patients and never before in my clinical experience, have I seen D-dimers and the amount of people with positive D-dimers higher than 2,000, higher than 3,000, higher than 5,000. My clinical experience told me that I need to go look for a large clot either in their legs or in their lungs. And I ended up doing CT scans on these people. Most of them, and I would say almost all of them, had negative CT scans, which started making me think that if there was not a significant lot in their lungs, but my d dimer level is so much higher than what I was usually seeing. It means that it might not be concentrated in one clot, but that it is multiple small micro thrombi that is extended throughout the body. And that's so easy to miss because the CT scan is not going to pick up on that. These people that were coming in with d dimer levels were all people. They were in my department from anything from about a week till about four months after receiving their second injections. There are certain factors that can influence a D-dimer test that can give you a sense of a higher level than would be expected in the body. That said, the patients that I was doing D-dimer levels on did not have a level of a maybe positive 500, 400 readings. It was more than 3,000, more than 5,000. So those are significantly positive without any proof of having a pulmonary embolism. If I was seeing high levels of D-dimers without a definite diagnosis, I needed to ask more questions. One study said, never ignore extremely elevated D-dimer levels. They are specific for serious illness, including venous thrombosis, sepsis, and or cancer. Even if sharply elevated D-dimers are seemingly solitary finding, clinical suspicion of severe underlying disease should be maintained. There were two conditions that stood out, and the first one was disseminated intravascular coagulation, shortly known as DIC. The second one is antiphospholipid syndrome. Both of these conditions are related to an abnormality in either the initiation or the feedback of the coagulation pathway, as well as the thrombosis or thrombolysis cycle, where clots are being broken down. DIC is a serious, sometimes life-threatening condition in which the proteins the blood involved in blood clotting becomes overactive. It's a cascade that is difficult to stop once it's reached a certain level. There are certain conditions that trigger DIC, significant sepsis, underlying viruses, parasitic infections, trauma, major surgery, pregnancy and childbirth, the less common causes, toxic drug reaction blood transfusion reactions, organ transplants. So there was a connection with intravascular products and a possible DIC. Most cases of DIC is diagnosed rapidly and suddenly, which is the acute presentation. But there are cases in which it develops gradually, occurring over a longer period of time. This is known as a chronic form of DIC, and I would go as far as to say a subacute form of DIC that is very easy to miss. Simultaneous clotting and bleeding can occur with chronic DIC. The bleeding part comes in blood in the urine, headaches, other symptoms associated with brain bleeds, bruising, and formation of red small dots on the limbs, kind of a petechiae picture, bleeding at sites of wounds, and mucosal bleeding, which means bleeding out of the gums and out of the nose. I definitely saw an increase in nose bleeds and bleeding from previous wound sites, ulcers, as well as rashes that could not be explained. 
the blood clotting symptoms and signs was symptoms like chest pains, heart attacks, strokes, TIAs, headaches related to either bleeding or not, as well as symptoms related to kidney failure because of the clotting of those smaller blood vessels that goes to the kidneys. Antiphospholipid syndrome is a very similar type of condition, but the basis of the antiphospholipid syndrome is an autoimmune disorder meaning that the body's immune system makes proteins known as antibodies that mistakenly attacks its own cells or tissues. That gives a skin the cascading effect of a clotting disorder, but it is linked to an autoimmune trigger. Basically, it presented exactly in the same way. High blood pressure, which I was seeing way more of first diagnosis of high blood pressure, strokes, heart attacks, TIAs, heart valve problems, repeated headaches or migraines, vision loss, balance and mobility problems, difficulty concentrating or thinking clearly. The astute listener would start forming a picture of what we've been told what is COVID-19. And there are research papers connecting COVID-19 with an underlying vascular disease. One of these was a study called COVID-19, Unraveling the Clinical Progression of Nature's Virtually Perfect Biological Weapon. SARS-CoV-2, presenting as a COVID-19 syndrome, was not a respiratory basis, but it was an underlying vascular basis, which had certain phases of incubation, pulmonary phase, pro-inflammatory phase, which once again comes into a cytotoxic inflammation process, then goes over into a pro-thrombic phase, COVID-19 and thrombotic or thromboembolic disease, implications for preventions, anti-thrombotic therapy, and follow-up. This picture gives us first certain risk factors, homeostatic abnormalities that is linked to COVID-19, as well as clinical outcomes. In this picture, one of the tests that is mentioned there is an increased D-dimer level. It also mentions venous thromboembolism, myocardial infarction, and disseminated intravascular coagulation that is connected to postulated mechanisms of coagulopathy, as well as pathogenesis of thrombosis in COVID-19. I started asking the question, if we were able to detect certain connections between vascular abnormalities and COVID-19. And we based our proposed treatment on the spike protein, which includes the Pfizer and Moderna injections. Shouldn't we be looking for similar side effects or complications from that same injection? If we are mandating certain treatments, we do need to do the due diligence to make sure what is the side effects and the complications, especially in a time where there has not been long-term studies. And that is what led me to focusing on DE dimers. I know of Dr. Charles Hoff, and there's a couple of other physicians that have made that same connection to D dimers. And I do think that it's worth looking at. When I started asking some specialists regarding the D dimers, some of the internists, some of the cardiologists, and just asked them, are they seeing the same thing in their wards? Um, is anybody looking into it? There was no real interest to go digging deeper on this. We should be willing to ask questions if we are not sure, if we're in new areas, a new field, a new treatment, being humble enough and being honest enough to ask the questions. And I think that is what brought me to this point, especially in the last six months. I got to the point where I decided for myself, I was going to take a public Extends. If I remain silent now, I'm either complicit in this or just not brave enough to stand up against it. And that's why I decided to leave my job with the intent of saying I have to distance myself from this institution at this stage and start fighting this fight on a bigger scene or a different scene. I see it as worth it in the long term and what we've got to gain from not giving up.